Chapter 1. Variation under domestication. When we look to the individuals of the same variety or sub-variety of our older cultivated plants and animals, one of the first points which strikes us is that they generally differ much more from each other than do the individuals of any one species or variety in a state of nature. When we reflect on the vast diversity of the plants and animals which have been cultivated and which have varied during all ages under the most different climates and treatments, I think we are driven to conclude that this greater variability is simply due to our domestic productions having been raised under conditions of life not so uniform as, and somewhat different from, those to which the parent species have been exposed under nature. There is also, I think, some probability in the view propounded by Andrew Knight that this variability may be partly connected with excess of food. It seems pretty clear that organic beings must be exposed during several generations to the new conditions of life to cause any appreciable amount of variation, and that when the organisation has once begun to vary, it generally continues to vary for many generations. No cases on record of a variable being ceasing to be variable under cultivation. Our oldest cultivated plants, such as wheat, still often yield new varieties. Our oldest domesticated animals are still capable of rapid improvement or modification. It has been disputed at what period of life the causes of variability, whatever they may be, generally act, whether during the early or late period of development of the embryo, or at the instant of conception. Jeffrey St. Hilaire's experiments show that unnatural treatment of the embryo causes monstrosities, and monstrosities cannot be separated by any clear line of distinction from mere variations. But I am strongly inclined to suspect that the most frequent cause of variability may be attributed to the male and female reproductive elements, having been affected prior to the act of conception. Several reasons make me believe in this, but the chief one is the remarkable effect which confinement or cultivation has on the functions of the reproductive system. This system appearing to be far more susceptible than any other part of the organis organisation to the action of any change in the conditions of life. Nothing is more easy to tame than an animal, and few things more difficult than to get it to breed freely under confinement, even in the many cases when the male and female unite. How many animals there are which will not breed, though living long under not very close confinement in their native country? This is generally attributed to by Created instincts, but how many cultivated plants display the utmost vigour, and yet rarely or never seed? In some few such cases, it has been found out that very trifling changes, such as a little more or less water at some particular period of growth, will determine whether or not the plant sets a seed. I cannot here enter on the copious details which I have collected on this curious subject, but to show how singular the laws are which determine the reproduction of animals under confinement. I may just mention that carnivorous animals, even from the tropics, breed in this country pretty freely under confinement, with the exception of the plantigrades or bear family, whereas carnivorous birds, with the rarest exceptions, hardly ever lay fertile eggs. Many exotic plants have pollen utterly worthless in the same exact condition as in the most sterile hybrids. When on the one hand we see domesticated animals and plants, often weak and sickly, yet breeded quite freely under confinement, and when, on the other hand, we see individuals, though taken young from the state of nature, perfectly tamed, long-lived and healthy, of which I could give numerous instances, yet having their reproductive system so seriously affected by unperceived causes as to fail in acting. We need not be surprised at this system, when it does act under confinement, acting not quite regularly and producing offspring not perfectly like their parents or variable. Sterility has been said to be the bone of horticulture, but on this view we owe variability to the same cause which produces sterility and variability is the source of all the choices breed uh, productions of the garden. I may add that as some organisms will breed most freely under the most unnatural conditions, for instance the rabbit and ferret kept in hutches, showing that their reproductive system has not been thus affected. So will some animals and plants withstand domestication or cultivation, and vary very slightly, perhaps hardly more than in a state of nature. A long list could be given of sporting plants. By this time, gardeners mean a single bud or offset, which suddenly assumes a new and sometimes very different character from that of the rest of the plant. Such buds can be propagated by grafting, etc., and sometimes by seed. These sports are extremely rare under nature, but far from rare under cultivation, and in this case we see that the treatment of the parent has affected a bud or offset, and not the ovules or the pollen. But, this, but it is the opinion of most physiologists that there is no essential difference between a bud and an ovule in their earlier stages of formation. So that in fact, sports support my view that variability may be largely attributed to the ovules or pollen, or to both, having been affected by the treatment of the parent prior to the act of conception. 
These cases, anyhow, show that variation is not necessarily connected, as some authors have supposed, with the act of generation. The seedlings from the same fruit and the young of the same litter sometimes differ considerably from each other, though both the young and the parents, as Muller have remarked, have, has remarked, have apparently been exposed to exactly the same conditions of life, and this shows how unimportant the direct effects of the conditions of life are in comparison with the laws of reproduction, and of growth, and of inheritance. For had the action of the conditions been direct, if any of the young had varied, all would probably have varied in the same manner. <coughs> to judge how much, in the case of any variation, we should attribute to the direct action of heat, moisture, light, food, etc., is most difficult. My impression is that with animals, such agencies have provided very little direct effect, but apparently more in the case of plants. Under this point of view, Mr. Buckman's recent experiments on plants seem extremely valuable when all or nearly all the individuals exposed to certain conditions are affected in the same way. The change at first appears to be directly due to such conditions, but in some cases it can be shown that quite opposite conditions produce similar changes of structure. Nevertheless, some slight change, amount of change may, I think, be attributed to the direct action of the conditions of life, as in some cases, increased size from amount of food, colour from particular kinds of food and from light, and perhaps the thickness of the earth and climate. Habit also has a decided influence, as in the period of flowering of plants when transported from one climate to another in animals. In animals, it has a more marked effect. For instance, I find in the domestic duck that the bones of the wing weigh less and the bones of the leg more in proportion to pale skeleton than with the same bones in the wild duck. And I presume that this change may be safely attributed to the domestic duck find much less and walking more than its wild parent. The great and inherent development of the adders and cattle and goats in countries where they are habitually milked in comparison with the state of these organs in other countries is another instance of the effective use. Not a single domestic animal can be named which has not in some country drooping ears, and the view suggested by some authors that the drooping is due to the disuse of the muscles of the ear, from the animals not being much alarmed by danger seems probable. There are many laws regulating variation, some few of which can be dimly seen and will be hereafter men briefly mentioned. I will here only allude to what may be called correlation of growth. Any change in the embryo or larva will almost certainly entail changes in the mature animal. In monstrosities, the correlations between quite distinct parts are very curious, and many instances are given in Isidore Jeffries and Hilaire's great work on this subject. Breeders believe that long limbs are almost always accompanied by an elongated head. Some instances of correlation are quite whimsical, thus cats with blue eyes are invariably deaf. Colour and constitutional peculiarities go together, of which many remarkable cases could be given amongst animals and plants. From the facts collected by Hersinger, it appears that white sheep and pigs are differently affected from coloured individuals by certain vegetable poisons. Hairless dogs have imperfect teeth. Long-haired and coarse-haired animals are apt to have, as is asserted, long or many horns. Pigeons with feathered feet have skin between their outer toes. Pigeons with short beaks have small feet, and those with long beaks large feet. Hence, if man goes on selecting, and thus augmenting, any peculiarity, he will almost certainly unconsciously modify other parts of the structure owing to the mysterious laws of the correlation of growth. The result of the various quite unknown or dimly seen laws of variation is infinitely complex and diversified. But it is well worth, while carefully, to study the several treatises published on some of our old cultivated plants, as on the hyacinth, potato, even the dahlia, etc. And it is really surprising to note the endless points in structure and constitution in which the varieties and sub-varieties differ slightly from each other. The whole organisation seems to have become plastic and tends to depart in some small degrees from that of the tyrannical type.